good tank because the British Army never ordered it. It was purely a commercial offering and the Russians took to it in a big way. And they got a license, it was all done above board, and then put a much better gun in it than the British had done. They had a 45mm anti-tank weapon, which is actually quite effective against contemporary tanks. So from that point of view, it was an excellent little vehicle. It was reliable, but it was very, very rough. The actual suspension, the wheels and tracks that it runs on, gave people a very hard ride. And of course, like all tanks of the pre-war period, it's of bolted construction, so it's weak when it comes to defending itself against incoming rounds. But generally speaking, for its day, an excellent little tank. Just on a historical note, that what makes this tank interesting is that it was captured from the Russian army by the Finns during the Winter War. They did some minor modifications, used it for a while in their army, and then latterly they buried all these tanks in their defensive regions, particularly what was known as the Mannerheim line, and the tank was buried, so in its turret was showing it, it became part of the fixed defences. Back in the, uh, the sort of 70s and 80s, they started digging up the Mannerheim line, suddenly produced all these tanks, and we were able to do an exchange with them to get it for the tank museum, which is great, because it means we have a representative example, not only of a pre-war Russian tank, which is quite something to have, but also something which derived originally from a British design, and we have the British design from which it came also in the museum, so historically it's interesting. I should point out, of course, that the swastika on the turret has absolutely nothing to do with the Nazis. It is uh, a Finnish symbol, uh, one of the runic symbols that they employed, so it, it, in this case there's no Nazi association at all. On the German side, the field strength was roughly about three and a half million men. With the addition of the German allies, the Finns, the Slovaks and the Hungarians, the figure rises to nearly four million. In infantry, the Germans were therefore outnumbered by one million men at the outset. In terms of armour, the discrepancies were even larger. The Germans were able to employ something like 3,300 tanks to face the Russian 8,000. But numbers don't tell the whole story. In the case of Barbarossa, numbers are extremely misleading. Considering the operational readiness of the armies, the Wehrmacht was clearly superior. It was also battle-hardened, experienced, and it was well prepared and briefed for its task. By comparison, the Red Army suffered severe problems of manning, organization, training, logistics, supply. Even more importantly, the Germans were operating according to a carefully conceived master plan. The Red Army was in an extraordinary position. There was no recognizable military plan. The Red Army could neither defend nor attack. Many of its tanks were not suitable for the demands of World War II. The tank army, by 1936, was probably the biggest in the world. They not only had these little fellows, they had a series of tanks known as the BT series, which had been derived from the American Christie machine, some of the fastest tanks on Earth. And this massive army of tanks wiped out largely in the initial stages of Barbarossa, meant that the Russians had to rethink their designs and start again. So you almost, and it would be a dream to some tank armies, get a clean sweep of the board. And the Russians then come back with the T-34, arguably one of the best tanks of the Second World War, and the heavy KV series tanks, which they then fitted into their army. So really what you're seeing is the Germans kindly clearing up for the Russians a load of old junk which they'd had on their hands since the mid-30s. The first part of the war was really not an occasion for praising tank commanders. That was a martyrdom of Soviet uh, tank troops. Though one or two people did emerge which were very important. For example, um, uh, Chernyakhovsky, who was very young, he must have been about, yes, he was just in his very early 30s. He commanded a, a tank division in the terrible days of 1941 and really proved himself to be a very capable commander. He, in fact, went on to become not only an army commander, but a front commander. That gives you some idea of the caliber of these people. The awesome German armies, which the 170 understrength divisions of the Russian troops faced, were divided into three large groups. These consisted of 148 fully manned and equipped divisions. The German armour was grouped into 19 Panzer and 15 Panzer Grenadier divisions. 
The army group south was commanded by Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt and was charged with seizing Kiev and taking control of the Ukraine as far as the river Dnieper. Field Marshal von Bock's Army Group Center was to strike towards Smolensk. Army Group North under Field Marshal von Lieb was to attack through the Baltic states and seize Leningrad. Army Group Center was a larger formation than the forces which comprised the other two army groups. It had 50 German divisions, as opposed to 39 in Army Group South, and only 29 in Army Group North. It could deploy 910 aircraft, as opposed to 684 Army Group South, and 434 Army Group North. The two panzer groups under Von Bock's control in Army Group Center also claimed the lion's share of the tanks which were allocated to the Great Attack. Some 1,700 machines were available to Von Bock as opposed to 1,000 for von Rundstedt with Army Group South and 650 in Army Group Center with von Lee. The three German army groups were supplemented by 500,000 Finnish troops advancing from their homeland in 14 divisions and 150,000 Romanians attacking along the Black Sea towards Odessa. These forces, together with the Luftwaffe, which had devoted 80% of its operational strength, 2,770 aircraft, to the build-up of Barbarossa, fielded over 3,350 tanks, over 7,000 artillery pieces, 60,000 motor vehicles, and 625,000 horses. The Russian army still clung to its peacetime structure. Should war occur, then each military district would be transformed into army groupings, similar in structure to the Germans, which mirrored the German intentions. The North Soviet Front was to repel advances through the Baltic states and defend Leningrad from Finnish attack. The Northwest, West and Southwest Fronts would engage the three main German army groups, and the Southern Front would deal with any advance towards Odessa. Behind these similarities, the contrast between the warring nations could not have been greater. While Germany boasted one of the finest industrial infrastructures in the world, Russia had still not completed her industrial revolution. Stalin had declared in 1931 that one feature of old Russia was the continual beatings that she suffered for falling behind for her backwardness, for military backwardness, for agricultural backwardness. We are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make good this distance in 10 years. Either we do it, or they crush us. Ironically, the enemy which might now attempt to crush the Soviet Union was to rely heavily on tanks which the Russians had helped to develop. Between 1926 and 1933, the Red Army and the Reichswehr collaborated in secret on the development of weapons, on the development of tactics, on the development, by the way, of chemical weapons. Uh, and uh, the Russians were very interested in German ideas, and the Germans were very interested in Russian ideas, obviously. And there was, a, yeah, there was a, a, certainly a form of exchange there. Uh, and uh, by the way, many Russians today say that what really happened was German, early German successes were actually based on Soviet theory. Well, that's a little bit of national pride being thrown in. Undoubtedly, both sides were interested in the potentialities of the tank. That's very true. And the second thing they were interested in was the relationship between air ground cooperation between the tank and the dive bomber. Yes, that was true. But I don't think that's a justification for, for arguing that the Blitzkrieg and Soviet operations in depth are the same, because they're not. They're really not. The way, partly in the way in which they are practiced, they are different and partly the manner in which what objectives they set themselves are also different as well. By the early 30s, 10 prototype tanks had been designed and built in secret. The initial development of what would become the most technically accomplished and cost-effective tank program ever seen took place at the German Soviet tank school at Kazan in Russia. The firm grip of the party on the state meant that the Russian people were deprived of any suspicion of the huge build-up along their borders. The state-controlled media was devoid of any mention of the increasingly anti-Soviet rhetoric of Hitler, which may have provided a clue. They were totally unprepared, therefore, 
for the latest disaster which was about to descend on them. 